Uh, thank you, Bennett. The, the thing uh, missing from, uh, from that is I also got three O-levels. <laughs> and it is, for me, a very powerful distinction that 44 universities around the world have chosen to give me an honour degree, <clears throat> but I only actually managed to scrape for myself three O-levels. And in a sense, that was where I landed in the world of education. Um, in 1997, I was asked by David Blank Blunkett to join the Department of Education as a little wild card. I'd left the film industry. And um, my job was actually to go out and about and see what's happening in the schools, and particularly with the teachers. And I fell in love with the teaching profession. And like Sugata, I have no illusions at all that teaching profession is the key to a successful economy and a successful future for ourselves and all of our children. And that's really my starting point. However, I also discovered another thing. I started going to a lot of education conferences and realised that 99% of the speakers at those conferences had had a very good experience of education. They were successful. They had passed the exams, they'd got degrees, mostly first-class honours degrees. Uh, and in a sense, I realised that my most useful role was as a dissonant voice, as someone to say, well, um, it may have worked for you, it absolutely did not work for me. I was a disaster, it was a disaster, I was disengaged, and only after I left school at 16 and went and created my own curriculum at night school, uh, without bothering actually to take any exams, did I begin to understand l the process of learning and discovered to my stunned amazement that I was a natural and totally enthusiastic learner. And I go further, uh, I'm 73 this month, I've learned more in the last year or 18 months than any other period of my life because I teach. So, what I'd like to do in a very short time available, I've got 10 minutes of embedded clips and a dozen slides, and I hope it isn't death by PowerPoint, but I'm trying to take a sort of 75 minute lecture, really, and turn it to make one over, overall point, which is something that isn't taught, which is about talent and where ideas come from. And my concern is I don't think at the moment we have assessment processes or even an education process that sufficiently understands where talent comes from, how to utilise it, how to stimulate it and how to direct it. That's what I try to contribute to. So I'm going to start with um, something that was done at the RSA a couple of years ago. Extraordinary, num few num number of people seem to have seen it, but it's a brilliant uh, speech cut right down uh, by uh, Steve Johnson. The other point, I agree with everything Sugata said, with one exception. He mentioned that he doesn't use YouTube. I use YouTube an enormous amount, except that I download it, chop it up, and use it for my own purposes and in my own teaching. So I am a, an avid YouTube pirate, if you like, but also a utiliser. Here we go. For the past five years, I've been investigating this question of where good ideas come from. It's the kind of problem I think all of us are intrinsically interested in. We want to be more creative, we want to come up with better ideas, we want our organizations to be more innovative. I've looked at this problem from an environmental perspective. What are the spaces that have historically led to unusual rates of creativity and innovation? And what I've found in all of these systems, there are these recurring patterns that you see again and again that are crucial to creating environments that are unusually innovative. One pattern I call the slow hunch that breakthrough ideas almost never come in a moment of great insight, in a sudden stroke of inspiration. Most important ideas take a long time to evolve, and they spend a long time dormant in the background. It isn't until the idea has had two or three years, sometimes 10 or 20 years, to mature that it suddenly becomes accessible to you and useful to you in a certain way. And this is partially because good ideas normally come from the collision between smaller hunches so that they form something bigger than themselves. So you see a lot in the history of innovation, cases of, of someone who has half of an idea. There's a great story about the invention of the World Wide Web and Tim Berners-Lee. This is a project that Berners-Lee worked on for 10 years. But when he started, he didn't have a full vision for this new medium he was going to invent. He started working on one project as a side project to help him organize his own data. He scrapped that after a couple years, and he started working on another thing. And only after about 10 years did the full vision of the World Wide Web come into being. That is, more often than not, how ideas happen. They need time to incubate, and they spend a lot of time in this partial hunch form. The other thing that's important when you think about ideas this way is that when ideas take form in this hunch state, they need to collide with other hunches. Oftentimes, 
the thing that turns a hunch into a real breakthrough is another hunch that's lurking in somebody else's mind. And you have to figure out a way to create systems that allow those hunches to come together and turn into something bigger than the sum of their parts. That's why, for instance, the coffee house in the age of the Enlightenment or the Parisian salons of, of modernism were such engines of creativity because they created a space where ideas could mingle and swap and create new forms. When you look at the problem of innovation from this perspective, it sheds a lot of important light on the debate we've been having recently about what the internet is doing to our brains. Are we getting overwhelmed with an always connected multitasking lifestyle? And is that going to lead to less sophisticated thoughts as we move away from the slower, deeper, contemplative state of reading, for instance? Obviously, I'm a big fan of reading. But I think it's important to remember that the great driver of scientific innovation and technological innovation has been the historic increase in connectivity and our ability to reach out and exchange ideas with other people and to borrow other people's hunches and combine them with our hunches and turn them into something new. That really has, I think, been more than anything else the primary engine of creativity and innovation over the last 600 or 700 years. And so yes, it's true we're more distracted. But what has happened that is really miraculous and marvelous over the last 15 years is that we have so many new ways to connect and so many new ways to reach out and find other people who have that missing piece that will complete the idea we're working on or to stumble serendipitously across some amazing new piece of information that we can use to build and improve our own ideas. That's the real lesson of where good ideas come from, that chance favors the connected mind. Now, I profoundly believe that, and it strikes me that most classrooms, most, certainly most sixth forms, would gain a very great deal from looking at and discussing that. So I've established that I was not a, an academic success, but I did have passions. This is my passion, comics. I read comics avidly. I was able of my pocket money to buy about three, and I'd take them to school and I'd swap. But quite quickly, I moved from the very simple comics, Beano and Dandy, to rather more complicated comics. And these were story comics. These were 1,200-word stories, uh, mostly pretty heroic, about people doing extraordinary things, obviously a big emphasis on sport. Uh, but they were an incredibly important force, source of information to, for me at the age of seven, eight, nine. Uh, really very important. So there's the stories. Now, I don't think I was remotely unusual. I would guess that a third of certainly boys and maybe girls uh, at schools, at primary school in the UK and, on, and in transition years, read and enjoy one form or another of comics. I was luckier than most um, because uh, on the left here is my father. I didn't meet my father till I was uh, five years old because he was away fighting in the war. So to me, he was a totally heroic figure and very, very easy to identify with the characters that I read about in the comics. So I felt I had a personal connection with the stuff I was reading. My hero was a man called Alf Tupper. Alf Tupper was the classic, classic working class hero. He came from an extremely impoverished family. He was actually an orphan, lived with his aunt, uh, was a brilliantly talented runner, uh, and was very involved in a sort of permanent class war, um, running against the boys from the public schools uh, and attempting, and most, more often than not, beating him. So Alf Tupper was a really important character. The next important character, and there's a slide missing, here's how to mention her, turned up. So here we are, we're in 19, what are we, 1952-53. In 1964, uh, the Tokyo Olympics occurred, and um, I watched them avidly. I liked athletics a lot, largely as a result of Alf, and I discovered a new hero, a woman named uh, Anne Packer. Anne Packer won the 800 metres gold medal in a new world record and was quite remarkable. I'll come back to her in a moment. Uh, now we jump forward from 64 to 78. 1978, I picked up this book in a... I got it from an old bookshop in Los Angeles and found this single paragraph about this man I'd never heard of at all, called Eric Little, who, similar to Anne Packard, won the 400 metres in the 1924 Olympics, completely unfancied, and like her, had seldom, if ever, in fact, the both, of the, both of them on two occasions, had ever run the, these particular distances before. So they're both pretty remarkable stories. I took it along to a writer I knew, Colin Willand. He wrote The Treatment, that's on the left here, was actually originally called Runners, delivered to me in July 1978, and uh, the story of Chariots of Fire goes from there. But 
The truth is, had I the time, I could make exactly the same story I'm about to tell, I'm about to tell you about a dozen, well, certainly, certainly eight other movies that I produced. In 1992, I did a programme for the BBC, which I've taken, cut, edited, in order to try and make my overall point. Here it is. In 1964, I was 23 years old. I was pursuing a career in advertising, doing OK. I think I probably took more notice of that Tokyo Olympics, because I was an almost precise contemporary of the people who were going for the medals. And so I identified with them very strongly. And probably because she was particularly pretty, I identified with Anne Packer. And the delight uh, that I shared with her, I think she was pretty delighted, at her winning the 800 metres uh, during that Tokyo Olympics was something I'll, I'll never forget. I think it was one of the great moments uh, of my entire sport-watching career. I believe God made me for a purpose. But he also made me fast. And when I run, I feel his pleasure. Sorry if it ends in a rather hubristic way, but there's a point I want to make here. There is a precise relationship, precise relationship, between Alf Tupper, Anne Packer, Eric Little, and Chariots of Fire. Where, A, do you teach that, and when, and how do you assess it, and how do you create a generation of young people who understand that the ideas they're gaining at primary school, at secondary school, can actually be utilised and be enormously important to them. The reason I use the clip on the end of getting the, 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 um, the Oscar is very simply, that is my validation. The reason I can go around the world, possibly the reason I've got 22 of the 44 Academy, um, honorary degrees for all I know, is because of that moment. If I come second that day, just as if Eric Little had come second that day, or Anne Packer had come second that day, that entire house of cards would not have been, ever, ever, ever would have collapsed. And the point I'm trying to make is, it is about, and here's the next slide, it's about identity. Cinema is about identity. Life, I think, is about identity. School is about identity. Who do young people leave school with a strong sense of identity with? And what do they leave school with a strong sense of identity with as they then go on into their lives? Identity is crucial. What I teach is creativity. I teach that creativity is a muscle, it's not magic. There are a few geniuses, but they're statistically irrelevant. But talent is everywhere. And the most important of these, interesting enough, is that, resilience. I try to teach them they've got to be resilient. Why have they got to be resilient? Because most people will not necessarily either appreciate or understand their ideas. Therefore, they need the resilience to realise that the people assessing their ideas 
are probably wrong, or in many, many cases. And therefore, the resilience to bounce back and pursue the idea. I cannot tell you how many studios and people I try to persuade to make uh, Chariots of Fire, and Lord knows, Bugsy Malone, try and imagine going into studios and asking for finance for a film that only starred 12-year-olds. It was not easy. So it is resilience. I'm nearly finished. Um, I hope I'm nearly finished. Um, when I teach, I use this because I check the tweets afterwards whenever I've taught or lectured. This, is, this line here is the one that comes up. CDP is the ad agency I worked with, uh, with Alan Parker, Ridley Scott and others. But we were actively encouraged to be fearless. It gets treat, treat, tweeted and tweeted and tweeted. What I've realised is young people are longing to be allowed to be fearless. They are desperate for permission to become fearless and to have their ideas listened to and indeed themselves listened to. And we are the blockers. My role is to inspire rather than assess. I deliberately chose the girl gang because the tougher group for me to get to in terms of believing in their ideas are girls. It's tougher actually to get to girls than, than guys. I'm going to finish now with a, a, la a final embedded video which tries to show how I do it and what, what I do it from my home in Ireland. So this is where I work from each or most Mondays and Fridays, uh, doing seminars to universities at the moment in four universities around the world, uh, next year six, and um, I think they're working. Uh, the evaluations we're getting back are remarkable. Uh, these are roughly two hour seminars, streaming video, uh, I keep my notes on my iPad um, and, they, and they scroll up as I'm, as I'm working. Uh, it works. And one of the most interesting things that came back from the evaluations recently was that the students felt that they were part of 21st century learning. That was very important to them. They felt they were participating in 21st century learning, uh, which, frankly, is precisely the experience we were, we were trying to aim at. Cinema and television, in my judgment, are without question the most socially influential mass media of the early 21st century. Over the next 10 sessions, I'm going to try and take you through not just my own career, but the films that influenced me, and I think the films that allowed me to make the choices I made. This is an interview from 25 years ago with Bill Moyers for PBS. The creative community is supposed to be the group who are pushing, using their strengths, using their power, using their talents, to push against what is into what may be. Now this interrogate that a bit and I'd really like to uh, hear from you. Hello David. Uh, hi David. Hi David. Hi David. My question relates to how you worked with the key creatives during the process of, of filming. On the set, be there at the beginning, be there at the end and be there when you need it. Is there still a hunger or an appetite for the mission type films in today's movie going audience? What those films were, I would argue, was a salve they allow people to feel that there was a better world out there and that they themselves were capable of better. And I think that is the role of filmmakers. Politicians, by definition, can never be part of moving society forward because they're always trying to catch up with where society is. Our job, your job, is to move society forward. The film is yours. It's yours, it's the writers, it's the directors. It has to come from within you. If it doesn't, it's empty and it's a product. Everything is about the choices you make. Everything. Not just the people you work with, the themes you choose, the way in which you conduct your life, the things that are important to you, the way you use your time. It is all about choices. Our job is to be difficult. Because despite everything I've just said to you, I actually think cinema can represent hope. But it only will represent hope if you believe it. And if you believe the medium is powerful enough to deliver that. So I, I would have thought for an overall set of a title for the whole set of series of seminars, yeah, the cinema of hope would be something that I'd be very, very comfortable with.
See you very soon. And on that classic ending, thank you very much, Lord Putnam.